thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here uh, today. It's actually my first time in Vienna. Uh, I brought my husband with me, and we've been here one day, and after uh, exposing him to uh, Viennese hot dogs and chocolate, I'm not sure he's going to come back to the U.S. with me. <laughs> and we haven't even tried the beer yet. Um, no, but what I want to do today is share how some of the key political trends are driving our politics, uh, both here and around the globe, here in the United States, not here in the United States, where I live in the United States, but around the globe, and how you can leverage these to win your campaign. And when you think about um, social causes, corporate causes, even though the mission might be different, a lot of the tactics that can be used to be successful are the same. And what I'll do at the end of this is go through a couple corporate advocacy case studies uh, to share how we do corporate advocacy in the United States. Um, but before really sort of diving into the political trends, I think it's really important to set a little context for the times in which we live and how the times in which we live are driving our politics and how our politics, how activism is driving um, issues and people to get involved in causes to make a difference. And I um, have lived and studied U.S. politics for quite some time. And a few years into my former boss, President George W. Bush's White House tenure, Ameri America began a period of volatility with respect to our politics. Uh, it's a period of volatility that remains today. Uh, it remains in many parts around the globe. If you think about the U.S., three of the last four elections were change elections. In 2006, uh, when I was political director uh, in the White House for the president and the Republicans, uh, it was a pretty ugly year. Republicans uh, got bounced from the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Uh, then Barack Obama came into office in 2008 largely on his campaign of hope and change, and in part a repudiation of President Bush, particularly his, uh, his Iraq war. Um, and then 2010, Barack Obama overreached. He was too aggressive with health care, and the Tea Party rose up and put Republicans back in Congress and created divided government again. Uh, last election, 12, was largely stable, but I think this election, 14, will be a change election again. I think certainly if the election were held today, uh, Republicans would take control of the U.S. Senate uh, because the president's popularity is such that uh, even though the Republican Party is unpopular, which it is very unpopular, as is the Democratic Party, but even though they're unpopular, it will all be because they're not Democrats. Republicans will win. And this has been going on basically for the last decade in American politics. And we see a lot of the same trend around the globe. Certainly, there is enormous volatility in the Middle East, um, in the, in the Middle East uh, to a lesser extent here in Europe. But you know, even when you think about the EU back in 2004, um, you know, left-leaning governments were largely in control in Europe in most places. By 2011, the pendulum swung, and you had uh, center-right governments in many places. Uh, now it's a little more divided, but certainly heading back appears to the left. And so the pendulum here has also been swinging. And, th and this pattern of volatility uh, around the globe has been fueled by an enormous amount of change that has occurred simultaneously. Five things specifically. The first, as Sasha mentioned earlier, is a breakdown of institutions, a breakdown in confidence in our institutions. So whether the presidency I mentioned is unpopular, the Congress in the United States has uh, a very low, uh, record low approval ratings. Basically in the United States, unless you wear a uniform, you're in the military or a police officer or a fireman, or you run a small business, the American public does not have confidence in your ability to lead or, or immediately distrusts or puts what you say through a lens of skepticism. We see that here in Europe. 31% um, of Europeans have confidence in the EU. That's actually higher than most Europeans look at their own governments. Still quite low numbers, although higher than the United States. Um, 
you know, we've gone through this incredible in economic collapse. Certainly the biggest uh, since the Great Depression in the States. Um, since the 80s, we've seen, but, the, but it's a trend that's been going on for some time. Since the 80s, we've, we saw a decoupling of wages in the U.S. So, you know, essentially it used to be that, that people with college degrees, um, you know, made a little bit more money than, than someone without a college degree, but they largely, you know, in, uh, wages were rising and they were tracking in the same uh, level. But in the early 80s, essentially what happened is, you know, there was a decoupling effect. If you were educated, your wages went like this, and if you weren't educated, your wages went flat. And that has had a profound impact on politics. Um, here in Europe, you know, half of people when surveyed recently said unemployment was their country's biggest priority or should be their country's biggest priority. We see increased globalization uh, uh, parallel to that uh, trend. The fact that there's so much manufacturing that's moved to other places in the globe and the, the general interconnectivity of the continents uh, has displaced some people and that's royal politics that certainly happened here and abroad. And then changing demographics. S you know, since 1992 in the United States, the share of the white vote has dropped 15 points, uh, something President Obama was very successful at is communicating, particularly with a rising Hispanic population. Um, here, you know, we see the Muslim population expected to grow by 15 million over the next 20 years. Uh, certainly higher in some countries than others, but you know, nonetheless, th this has a profound change in politics. And then what I really want to spend time talking about today uh, is the technological revolution that has transformed really how we are educated, how we do our work, and how we conduct our politics. And you know, this disruption that technology has created along with a combination of these other factors over the last 10 years changing, you know, ha has really created a scenario of winners and losers. And you have a wired, wealthy class that's dominating the economy today in the U.S. or playing a very dominant role in the economy in the U.S. Um, and there's a lot of other people who aren't in that economy, who maybe don't have a college degree, or aren't completely connected with technology or lost their job because of a financial meltdown and they have a lot of anxiety and we are still churning through that process and that anxiety is an opportunity because people are looking and hungry for somebody who can make a difference in their life somebody who can speak with their voice and certainly if you're a corporation you know, it's a necessity for you to start engaging with folks. And the reason it's a necessity is because governments around the globe are cash strapped. And, and when you have a system where government creates winners and losers, somebody is a loser. And they, when they're looking for more revenue, they go after the people with the, re with the money which a lot of times is the corporations. And so it is in a company's own interest to get engaged in politics and to get engaged on issues that matter to them and to defend their brands and to defend their practices because they run the risk of, of losing, becoming a loser. And so we see this all happening, certainly uh, to a larger extent in the United States, but to some extent uh, also here in Europe. And I think increasingly we will see a trend of more corporate activism uh, here in Europe and in other parts of the world. Um, but with respect to technology and how this has played a role in this dynamic, um, it's been incredibly disruptive. And while technology has displaced some people, it's largely been really important in society around the globe. I mean, you think about the fact that more people today around the world have a smartphone than have either electricity or clean drinking water. It tells you a lot about our ability 
to make a connection with people. And the smart, um, smartphones and technology have done for politics and corporate advocacy is they have transformed the way we communicate with people. Politicians, corporations, we now have a direct connection to voters, to constituents, to brand followers. Uh, Barack Obama most famously utilized Facebook in 2008 when it was a relatively new medium. Today he has 38 million people following him who like him on Facebook. He has a direct connection. Most of them are Americans, people who have the propensity to vote for him or the possibility to vote for him. He has a direct connection with them. If you think about the Arab Spring, it would not have been possible without Facebook or Twitter or text messaging. Um, technology has sped up what was a trend in the Middle East, which is for a more democratic movements. And while uh, that seems to ebb and flow, depending upon uh, what quarter you're in, you know, th there's no denying the trend is moving in, in the direction of at least a more open and democratic societies. Technology's had a huge role in that. Um, just this week in the United States, um, Justin Bieber. <laughs> Justin Bieber decides to drive 100 miles an hour on a rented Lamborghini in Miami, and now there's a movement in the United States to deport him back to Canada. <laughs> All being fueled... <laughs> I gotta sign the petition. <laughs> All being fueled through social media. And so it is having a really incredible effect on how we communicate. And it's changed, uh, changed the way, again, how not just politicians, but also corporations and brands engage on issues that matter to them. Um, I think largely, though, the, the PR professionals uh, and campaign professionals have mastered the mediums. And the mediums are going to change, and there's going to be new things and new social media technologies, but people are largely sort of know today, you know, that utilizing these things is good. You can mobilize people, you can communicate with them, and are using technology in the ways that it can benefit them. What is different, though, and what is still uh, ongoing and changing rapidly is is the big data revolution. And while the President Obama had used a lot of big data techniques in his campaign in 2012, you know, certainly, you know, certainly um, we don't, we see um, corporations really pretty far behind on this regard. And so you might have 15% of the companies around the globe that have a data officer or somebody that wakes up and thinks about how to utilize data. Um, so this is still a changing trend. It's still a evolving trend. And part of the reason is because the world's data is doubling every 20 months. 90% of the world's data was created in the last basically two, two to three years. And it's the interconnectivity of all these devices that allows to do this kind of rich data mining technique. Um, I think future campaign managers, you know, in the United States, they're all going to be the data scientists, and that that will be unusual. Again, o President Obama has utilized some of this stuff, but you know, ultimately, the people who made decisions in the campaign, the senior strategists in the campaign, were the guys that actually made the TV ads. That's typically how it's been done in the U.S. It wouldn't be surprising if the next campaign, or perhaps it'll take another cycle or two, a future campaign, it'll be a data scientist, a pollster slash data scientist who is the chief strategist in the campaign. And um, what these data scientists will do with this data is take advantage of sort of the digital intelligence and use it to find and mine voters, but also to create efficiencies. And all these interconnected devices allow you to um, look for little patterns, little trends that can get you a couple extra percentage points in turnout. It can 
boost your sales a couple points. Any of you who work for a public company knows, knows that a you know, 1% you know, uh, revenue growth beating expectations doesn't sound like much, but it's sure a big deal to the market. And that's what this big data will be used for. And you, from campaigns, you'll see it particularly in the future in the use of radio and TV targeting will get very sophisticated. Um, we in the United States spend so much of our time and money doing television advertising. Um, and it's the least data driven. That's really where the next focus in politics in the US is. Um, but it's, it's not just for media. And this is certainly applicable here. Uh, uh, when you think about f uh, fundraising for those of you who raise money in your campaigns or just communications, you know, this kind of interconnected devices and this kind of data mining allows you to figure out not only what day of the week to send an email to your supporters, but actually what time of the day you should send it. And, you know, which of five or six different headings should you use to better master your communications and create an extra bit of efficiency. And it's very important for money, you know, for fundraising, you know, sort of being able to mine this and how people behave and when they behave and when they're likely to pay attention. And everyone's going to be a little bit different and knowing that and creating clusters and groups will help tremendously. Um, and so taking this big data and taking these political trends we see around the globe, which is sort of anxiety and activism, and thinking about the fact that we're really in a ripe universe to involve people and engage them. And, and we need to be doing that because uh, we live in pretty challenging times. Uh, you know, you see um, how brands and how companies are starting to take these techniques and put them to practice on behalf of, of uh, their objectives. Um, I was reading an article last week in the London, one of the London papers, the Daily Telegraph, and it was titled, First Tobacco, Then Booze, Then Sugar. The control freaks would happily ban everything. I just, I, it was the headline, it just caught my attention. And I thought, oh my gosh, they must be talking about the, the Obama White House. And then I looked at it a little more carefully, and I thought, um, oh my, they're talking about Great Britain and specifically Europe more broadly. Um, and so many of the issues that we are faced with in America, those are big dominant issues that are being debated in various levels around, around the states. But many of these issues that we face are the same issues that, that Europeans are facing. Their governments are tackling these issues as well. And um, we've been pretty familiar with activism against sort of corporate America in the states for quite some time. So in 1970, the Congress banned uh, tobacco companies' ability to do advertising. And the tobacco executives looked out and saw that they were headed for a 10 to 15 year fight against their brands and their products. And out of that was born a grassroots advocacy uh, effort uh, for people who didn't think government should be involved in these kinds of things or who happened to be smokers and liked smoking and didn't want their taxes raised. And that was really sort of the first time we saw it. But it was pretty, it was done pretty intermittently. And, um, but today, when you think about how companies deal with it versus then, is that, that the, the big ones with the big challenges who look out and say, okay, for the next 10 years, because of all this political upheaval that we face, I've, I'm going to be dealing with challenges to my brand and my organization. Um, you know, they're running largely permanent campaigns now. And because one day it's, one day it's a tax increase potential, the next day in the case of uh, the beverage industry, it's an ingredient fight uh, followed by you know, some study that's released that's not accurate or has some small sample size but nonetheless generates a ton of media. And, and so th they're starting to look at this the way a party does. Democrat 
and Republicans, while we gear up in election years, we run permanent campaigns. We have buildings with, operative, with hundreds of operatives that work around the year, election year or not election year. And corporate America is starting to develop that mentality too. And more than just the really big companies, but you know, even those that are sort of lowered down the Fortune 1000 scale. And so the beverage industry is one example, the non-alcoholic beverage industry in the States is one example that deals with a constant barrage of people fighting their brands. And, you know, essentially, you know, what they need to do, and a lot of what's happened because of social media, is that a, perhaps a study gets released and it says diet soda will rot your teeth uh, worse than methamphetamine. And if you read the fine print, it'll be N equals 50 people, and they'll all be like in Appalachia, and like there'll be no cause and effect, and this kind of stuff gets put out all the time. And then it gets in Twitter and it just explodes. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, legitimate dietitians and um, doctors and other people who see this and just forward it on. Maybe they don't read it carefully or, you know, maybe that's their general predisposition, what have you. But it just, this gets out there and it's in, in Twitter and every influential journalist in America, and I suspect in many of your countries, sits on Twitter a couple hours a day looking at what their colleagues are doing. And so social media has become a huge battleground in the sort of corporate advocacy fights. Um, one of the things that I've seen done successfully in the States is essentially a monitoring, just setting up a monitoring system so you know what's being said. And so if you think about soda and then what's being said, how to categorize it, how to decide whether it's worth responding to or not, similar tactics we use in political campaigns, and then pushing back when appropriate, when necessary, when there's false or bad information out there. And so by monitoring all of social media, what we largely see, essentially in the case of sort of the non-alcoholic beverage industry, is that most people use social media to talk about what I would call nonsense. This is true in a lot of for a lot of issues, but particularly this one. I just got up and had my first Coke of the day. I um, just went for a run and I grabbed a Gatorade. And this will just be stuff people put. I mean, you, all of you who follow social media, you know, probably ask yourselves, you know, why is Johnny or Jimmy or Mary telling me that they just walked their dog? But people do that. So the, the, this happens true. Too, and it, this makes it more complicated because you got to sort of sift through all that and like push it aside because it's just noise. But then there's a bunch of people that get out there that are real advocates, and they talk about um, what the brand means to to them personally. My kid had a birthday party, and everybody had a Coke, and we all were together as a family, and it was it was a wonderful time for us to celebrate. Ah, Coke. Pepsi celebration. That, that's a, you know, from a brand management perspective, that's a good thing. Yet then there's this other subset. The subset that, that goes through uh, some of the examples I talked about, and, and one of them is obesity. And so when you start to drill down using big data techniques, by, and you drill down and you categorize this stuff, and you start to see the trends, and you see what's going viral. You know, what, there's a study, you know, that talks again about teeth or, you know, something that says, you know, Diet Coke, there was, uh, so this happened last week, Diet Coke causes cancer, sugar substitutes. Okay, so this is what's happening, and this is a real risk to the category and to the brand. So what is the brand going to do about it? The brand's going to do about it? Well, you create a digital army, much like the field networks of, 10 or 15 years ago, you create people online who have information, who have knowledge, who have an ability to communicate with you and take that knowledge and put it out so that 
when people push forward false information, which happens a lot in campaigns, but also here for corporations, when you push this out, you have the ability to sort of fight back and in a very fact-based way. And so in this particular case, this individual, this doctor, saw a soda and said, soda ban, because there's lots of talks in the States about soda bans, may have the biggest impact on overweight e obese use. Oh, okay. Fairly innocuous statement. But person representing the coalition on behalf of the beverage industry pushes back and says, you know what? Fighting obesity requires education, not regulation. What we choose to eat and drink doesn't require oversight. Okay, so now we've established a we've established a viewpoint here, which is you may have an opinion that I don't agree with. You may think that soda is bad for somebody. That's people are going to have their own opinions. But let's agree that the government shouldn't regulate it. Woman writes back the doctor, the expert. Agree that education is most important. But decreasing unhealthy, unnutritious temptation at school can also help, okay? She's got a viewpoint, and she's entitled to her viewpoint. Coalition person pushes back and says, beverage makers replaced full-calorie soft drinks in schools and cut uh, uh, in, with low-calorie smaller portions and improved, you know, less than calorie consumption 97%. Fact-based information getting put out there, very labor-intense, but when you're, when you're dealing with uh, information, um, it's really important that you have the ability to sort of push back and push back aggressively. And another just quick example in this particular one is, you know, uh, some, a blogger puts out, hey, a tired, skip the energy shot. S there's a study that says energy drinks may increase heart uh, contraction rates in unhealthy pe or in healthy people. Okay, so it's a, that's a statement about caffeine, which most people consume every day. And it is a fact that in a lot of energy drinks, there's less caffeine than in a regular sized cup of coffee. But, but by reading that statement, you wouldn't know that. You'd think, ooh, I saw a study again that sounded bad. And so by putting out fact-based information, by taking big data, by mining it, by categorizing it, by figuring out what's important and who's important, this is an important point, you know, who is an important voice in these social media, and by being able to sort of target communications to the right um, individuals who, are, who disseminate information, so it also work in campaigns, you, know, you can run a much broader and more aggressive campaign and a much smarter campaign. And that's exactly what happens in some places uh, on behalf of some brands and some corporations um, in the United States. And so, what the beverage industry has seen is a dramatic ability to get in social media and change a conversation by simply putting out, you know, CDC, Centers for Disease Control Studies that combat information that is perceived to be false by them or something they think is a mis misrepresentation of science or a misrepresentation of their brands. Um, <coughs> oil, energy, climate change, these are huge issues all over the globe. Um, and in the case of the oil industry in the United States, um, you know, what we've seen, again, is sort of an understanding, particularly, you know, with Barack Obama coming to office, that he has a very different view on usage of energy in the United States. He has a different view. And whether you agree with him or not, if you're, if you're sitting in an energy company in the United States, and his team of people walks into the White House and now is in charge, you know, that's a, that you know that you're going to likely be dealing with more regulation, higher taxes if they have their way, and things are going to change. And so in a permanent mentality, in a permanent campaign mentality, what you see is them building a permanent group of people who share the views and the beliefs of uh, folks that represent oil energy interests in the United States uh, and, and put them in a community and activate them. And so this has been something that, that has been done for the last several years. 
And by using big data techniques and by using social media mining and other things, you're able to see the number of people uh, who support the industry and who are educated about the industry increase dramatically, both, both just through regular email list management, but then also from Facebook and others. And what you're able to do is dramatically lower the cost per conversion of an advocate, which is really important in a campaign, in a political campaign. The cost per your donor acquisition will tell you a lot about your ability to raise money and spend it efficiently. And that's true, that's true across the board, whether you're in a social cause, working for a corporation, uh, or in a political campaign. And, and so one of the things is um, we had taken, we had done this campaign for a couple years and had had some success with it and had several hundred thousand people uh, that were active for different reasons, but were active. Um, and now we had an opportunity to say, okay, how do, we, how do we take what we know about them? How do we use some of these techniques, these data mining techniques, and figure out what's the potential audience? Or how would I find more people? And what's actually motive? Why are people signing up? What, what caused them to sign up in the first place? And you know, is there some set of messaging I can use that will better connect me and our brands with, with their interests and their activism, their self-interest. And so we, we spent a lot of time doing that. And so um, we took 100,000 energy citizen records, people who were engaged on behalf of the industry. Uh, you marry that with consumer data. Sasha talked about that earlier in the political context. And now you start, and then you take also social media data, because there's, you know, just like I mentioned in the non-alcoholic beverage example, there's all this conversation happening online. Whether you're, li whether you're paying attention to it or not, it's out there. Because if it's in the news and politicians are talking about it, I can guarantee you that consumers are talking about it. And we went out and found um, a lot of this conversation and figured out, okay, who's the relevant? What, let's, let's get rid of the noise. But what are the relevant conversations where either there's misinformation or positive information or something that we want to care about, that we would care about? And so we focused on sort of a subset of all those conversations. And then we took this example, Keystone, the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, as, as many of you know, America has gone through an energy renaissance in the last 10 years where the, the a discovery of um, uh, shale and um, oil in North Dakota and other places. And, you know, it has had a tremendous economic boon in some places in the country. So this has been a really active conversation uh, in the news. And then, of course, there's the Keystone Pipeline, um, which has been a very controversial and very um, uh, debated topic for pushing five years. And uh, so there's been a lot of people talking about this topic, with or without uh, the interest by uh, anybody who might uh, be involved in the energy industry. And so then by doing this, you figure out, okay, who's favorably disposed for some reason, economic or otherwise, and develop sort of personas around them, okay? How do I cluster people? How do I, you know, figure out the groups of people and why they're motivated to care about what I care about and engage them on our behalf? And we did that, and basically what we learned was the sort of four groups of people on the web that were talking about energy broadly, but, but Keystone Pipeline and other uh, shale and fracking issues, which again, very controversial. But so you had environmental realists. So you had people who generally had a concern about the environment, wanted to see things improve at the environment, but, but also sort of said, I get it, you know, we're all gonna drive, we're gonna have oil, we need these things, we gotta have them safe and reliable, and this is important. There was another group that was just economically concerned. You know, I don't want my gas to go up. I don't want to pay more. Um, you know, I'm, I'm making ends meet, you know, barely as it is, and I can't afford a higher energy cost. And then you had sort of the politically savvy types, and these are people who uh, may have been sort of partisan Republicans or people who generally, um, you know, sort of were involved in sort of the political debate in some way and sort of had picked the side because, because they were on that side. And... Then you had this other group that was genuinely concerned about national interests, national security interests particularly. 
I don't like buying oil from the Middle East. I don't want to buy oil from the Middle East. I want to get it from right here in the good old USA. And you could basically put people in one of these four categories. And what that allowed the ability to do, you know, and you've, we figured out other information about them, their sort of how they clustered economically, age, uh, geogra geogra geography wise, college education, helped us sort of better communicate with those individuals. And so then we start, okay, here's, what's the profile of an energy citizen? You know, and looking at this data, you know, we said, okay, you know, of the people we have, this million plus database that we've amassed, we've got almost 25% of them who, who will be a champion. You know, they'll take four or five actions on your behalf. They'll call a legislator, they'll go to a town hall, you know, and again, I mentioned the core motivating factors. They had different reasons for being there, but, but if, if you were able to connect with them on the thing that they cared about, they were more likely to do something, which is important. We saw that even though men dominated this across the board, um, there was a vocal minority in women, and they were vocal, and that was important. Uh, and then we saw that there was an ability to sort of you know, align with less tradition traditional allies. You know, and so when you think about people who are really concerned about unemployment, you know, we have a lot of immigrants and minorities in the US who are the last in the economy and the first out. And so when you appeal to them on an economic message, they're more likely to connect with you. And the same is true for young people who had, um, who had sort of career objectives and, and, and people who see this incredible rebirth of energy in the United States and want to be a part of it because there's an opportunity to get involved and, and have a, a career. And so, you know, sort of understanding that, who these people were, why they were showing up, and what motivated them allowed for a more intelligent campaign and one where you could really drive a lot more activism. And so just, you know, I mentioned the Keystone Pipeline being one of many energy issues in the country you know, sort of building out this activism base and having an expanded social presence, you know, meant let's have a very aggressive Twitter strategy. Because we saw that 60% of the conversation on the web was happening on Twitter. And I mentioned earlier that the most influential people were on Twitter. So, and including a lot of the journalists who cover news. And it was really important that that be a focus of intention. That your message and your facts get out on Twitter. Um, and then you leverage these various online properties and mediums to activate and educate and to put them into action. And so lots and lots of comment periods in the government about the Keystone Pipeline, the State Department, and, and, and you know, by building out this community, by understanding who they were and why they showed up in the first place, you know, you're able to leverage them to, to, to go and submit a comment or call a member of Congress or attend a local chamber meeting or a local city council meeting, you know, where some of these energy forums are being debated, energy topics are being debated. And that all happened by building out an online community and by using some of the data techniques and understanding, again, going back to kind of the beginning, where, you know, you, understanding sort of the political dynamics that are going on in the United States and understanding how to leverage technology and put them together to create an online community uh, that is beneficial to the clients. And so I gave you sort of two examples that I've seen and observed uh, in the corporate space. And um, those are two corporate organizations broadly that face these challenges all over the globe and they're pretty adept at doing these. But this methodology will work. And it works whether you're in politics, whether you're focused on a social cause or whether you're working for a Fortune 50 brand. And, and that is this, you know, is to identify and to target the right audience. Figure out who you're gonna communicate with and use data and data science to help you do a better job of, a, a better, to create a better starting point. And then build on the foundation, you know, what, what you want to do is create a platform in which you can communicate with people, whether that's through digital advertising, 
uh, whether that's through a social media strategy, whether that's through a television ad campaign, or whether that's through do knocking on specific people's doors. All of that allows you to create the medium by which you take the data and start to um, recruit people with. So now we're out recruiting people and figuring out, because we now we know who we're talking to, we've created a way and a medium in which to engage with them, and we're engaging. And we're having a conversation. And if we're smart, we're not just asking them for something. We're giving them something. We're, we're, we're engaging with them on a daily basis, and it's, it's not a one-way conversation. It's a two-way conversation. Uh, and then after we have developed a relationship with them, online or otherwise, then we activate them. And so, you know, I've seen this work in politics. I've seen this work in social causes, and I've seen this work in, um, for corporate America. And lastly, before I take questions, I'll just sort of go through some additional best practices. I mean, that, to me, the last slide is really about the process, and this is really about making sure you're really effective uh, when you're doing it. And the first thing is to listen. If you listen to your audience, which if you've done your data mining, is gonna, they're going to be different audiences. If you listen to them, you'll figure out kind of what they're into. And we see this across the board in, in politics and corporate campaigns is, you know, some people engage with you anywhere. They'll, they'll, they'll make a phone call. They'll show up to a town hall meeting. They'll post stuff on Facebook. But a lot of times you'll find that people engage in one medium. And if you listen to them, you'll figure out how, how and where you can leverage them best. Engagement is a ladder. What you want to do is get someone in the door. You want to establish a connection with them. You want to ask them to do something simple. It doesn't take up a lot of time. You want to create a dialogue with them. You want to move them up the ladder. You want them to do a little bit more. And looking at it that way means that when you're really in a dogfight, you'll be much more likely to get them to, to be there for you uh, when you really need them to show up somewhere or write a letter or do something that takes you know, significantly more time. Uh, leverage current events. It's not just about <coughs> Barack Obama or Soda or the Keystone Pipeline. Talk to them about what's going on in the world. Don't be careful not to sort of you know, wrongly connect your issue or candidate with the current event or, or specifically something that's, you know, going on. But, you know, I, I see this, and we do a ton of online advertising um, in, uh, in my companies, and, and I see this every year. They, um, the open rates and the activism, activism rates spike at Valentine's Day. Because if you put out some kind of Valentine-themed, kitschy thing, it catches people's attention. And that's true across the board. Is if you're engaging in something that is not just about your topic, but you're somehow connecting it, that will help with your engagement rate. Because people are now sort of coming back for more content. Um, and you should take advantage of people's curiosity gap. Ask questions. Put out you know, challenges and ask people how they'd solve it. Uh, that helps draw them in. And this is really, really important. And, um, it's so simple and it seems obvious, but it's amazing to me how few people really take advantage of it. And that's images over text. We are a visual society and we are becoming more visual. And images work better than lengthy text. And um, so across the board, you know, I think if, if, you know, whatever your goal professionally is, whether again, you're working on a campaign or you're working in a social cause, I think these lessons can be, be learned. You know, if you take data, if you understand your political climate and what is motivating and fueling the broader population, you take the best of data mining techniques, and you take the best sort of advocacy, you know, sort of tried and true and tested messages, you can be successful. Um, and uh, a lot of this is interchangeable, depending upon what it is that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and so with that, um, I will take questions, and thank you very much.